Uh, welcome and thank you all for coming to the third installment of our series on ocean change, proactive wages. <laughs> um, <laughs> this seminar is organized by the students in the aggregate program on ocean change, or the IPOC. Um, the IPOC is an interdisciplinary PhD training funded by the National Science Foundation and supported by the College of the Environment. It brings together students and faculty from various fields who share an interest in interdisciplinary ocean change research. For more information on this program, you can visit our website, which is on the slide right there. Uh, this lecture series is also made possible by the support of the Joint Institute of the Study of the Atmosphere and Ocean and by the College of the Environment. Thank you again for your continued support. Today, we encourage audience, me audience members to live tweet the seminar using the hashtag IPOC2014 on the slide. We also encourage you to attend the remaining lectures in our series. It continues on February 12th with Dr. Andrew Rosenberg, Union, the Union of Concerned Scientists. I would like to welcome our speaker for today, Senator Kevin Ranker. Senator Ranker represents the 40th District in the Washington State Senate. He is a, a strong proponent for advancement of coastal and ocean policy with an emphasis on coastal economic development, energy policy, energy policy and conservation. Currently, he also serves as the Vice President of the Pacific Northwest Economic Region. Before his time on the Senate, Senator Ranker served as a San Juan County Commissioner, was part of the Ocean Foundation as a Senior Fellow, and in 2011 was appointed by the White House to be an advisor to President Obama's National Ocean Council. Please, welcome, please join me in welcoming Senator Ranker. There's tape on the floor. Am I supposed to stand like right here or right here or something? That was fun. I don't, I'm joking. Um, hi. I, thank you uh, very much all for being here. Uh, thank you, Terry, and everyone else for inviting me. Uh, this is actually, I hope, another powerful experience for me. I love doing stuff like this because it takes me away from the, um, <laughs> the drama of politics. Um, it's kind of like living in a really bad dysfunctional alcoholic family. That's what your state legislature's like. Um, that will be the first of many things I say today that remind me that I'm on camera. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm Kevin Ranker. I uh, have been in the Washington State Center for six years. Um, I, uh, I don't know. I've, I've been surfing and diving and fishing my entire life. And so for me, I really kind of stand on the beach and look outward for most of my life and think about ocean issues and ocean priorities. Um, since being in politics, it's forced me to really turn around and look upland. Um, and Jan is here, and, and Jan and Terry and I have worked together for a number of years on a number of different issues that have so, has been associated with watersheds. And um, for me, it's uh, it, it's amusing that I'm dealing in politics with all of this stuff when really where I started from was just being on the beach and wanting to care about coastal issues. Um, and I can get to more of that in a bit. But what I want to talk to you today is just uh, about the reality of everything we care about and how do we actually turn that into action. And so the whole point of this is that um, we can, um, did that change it? Right on. So I, I hear this a lot, particularly here at the U. Um, you know, the science is clear and uh, the facts speak for themselves. My other favorite one that I hear all the time is that we're researching something that's so important that, uh, you know, it's going to sell itself, and this policy is absolutely the best thing to do, and so it's going to sell itself. Um, and unfortunately, um, did that come up? I'm, I need to be back here so I can see it. Yeah, so you're not correct. You're not in conformity with fact or truth. It's an incorrect calculation. It's contrary to conscious or moral or law. Um, so what I'm trying to get at here is that uh, the facts don't speak for themselves. The science doesn't speak for itself. And... Um, sitting in a lab and coming up with the best possible solution to something or the best idea uh, is not the goal. The goal is to turn that into action. The goal is to make sure that your science, the work that you're doing, everything you care about actually turns into action. And you may not be the individual who's the one who's taking it from the science to the action, but you need to make sure you're communicating to the people that are because if you're not, it simply doesn't matter. We cannot do science policy in a vacuum. We need to turn it into actions and actionable items so that policy makers, uh, such as myself and many other levels above me, uh, actually understand why it matters. Because unfortunately, a majority of my colleagues don't know what the hell we're talking about. 
Uh, and let me give you an example of that. I was in, um, um, I think the meeting was in Mississippi. Uh, it, was a, it was a meeting of uh, uh, state legislators from around the country, uh, thousands of us, uh, uh, hundreds of us at least, I don't know. That's the never let the truth get in the way of a good story piece. So um, there was a lot of people there, all state elected officials, and I uh, gave this passionate speech about how we needed to form a coastal caucus of state legislators because there wasn't one, and we had so many commonalities in, in coastal and ocean issues, and I talked all about how the president was forming this National Ocean Council and all these different things, and, uh, and people were kind of nodding and into it. And so at the end, this uh, senator stood up, and I, I don't know if he was from Louisiana or Mississippi, but he looked like Colonel Sanders, uh, and he's a really neat guy. I'm not putting him down. Great guy. But what he said was, he, stood up, he stands up and he says, he says, I move that we form a coastal caucus, uh, just like this young man said. And then he said, and I further move that we make him chair because, like the rest of you, I have no idea what he's been talking about. And um, something hit me, and, and, and I kind of went, oh, my God. Like, you know, literally a majority of my call, and it's not – each of us have different passions, right? I mean, in the Washington State Senate, there's 49 of us, and I can go to Senator Kaiser and know that she is going to know healthcare issues far better than anybody else that I work with in the Washington State Senate, and I also can trust her because we have similar idealistic views. So we each have different passions, right? But on some of these very important ocean sciences particularly, in the Washington State Legislature, I can count three, maybe four of us who pay attention to it, um, and uh, a couple of us that maybe dive in deep. And on a national level, unfortunately, except for some places like Rhode Island, Island California, um, Oregon, Massachusetts, and Maine, forget it. Uh, it. Maybe there's not even that many. And so um, that has got me into this place where I want to talk to more people and, and uh, not just my colleagues, educating my colleagues, but talk to people like you who are doing really important research and really important work, and let's start figuring out how we can communicate this in a way that matters. So let's talk about climate. So An Inconvenient Truth was an incredible message that got out to millions and millions of people, and it was just, it did so much to get people thinking about climate, and, and, and I really believe that Al Gore was our and remains one of our greatest assets in getting this message out. He definitely deserves his Nobel Peace Prize. Unfortunately, Al Gore is also our greatest liability. Al Gore made the entire discussion of climate change totally partisan, and he didn't mean to. I mean, I, I, it's not like Al and I are good buddies or anything. I, I don't know, but I don't believe that was in his intention. His intention was, this is really important. Let's get people thinking about it. Um, but because he's a Democratic vice president of the United States, um, and no, I won't go there. Never mind. I remembered the cameras on. Uh, uh, so uh, because he's you know a Democrat, it made it partisan, and and it's really really unfortunate. I mean, so I um, a couple years ago was lucky enough to go on a delegation from the United States to the UK at the invitation of the United the the, uh, the consulate uh, um, from the United uh, Kingdom, and. I got over there, and it was right when they had changed administrations. So they had gone to the conservative party from what? They had basically gone from like a Democratic president to a Republican president. There were two major things that didn't change in the administration's platform between those two. And they were addressing climate change and expanding renewable energy. And they went from far left to far right. As big of a shift, it was like going from Clinton to Bush. And the one big thing was looking at climate and energy, right? Uh, here in the United States, somewhere we went wrong, and this became fiercely partisan. And let's point out, and this is really important to remember, and we are incredibly blessed to have Bill Ruckelshaus, the rock star that he is, living right here in Washington State. Um, but uh, when Bill Ruckelshaus was the first director of the EPA, under President Nixon, the most fundamental laws of the land on the environment were created. The creation of EPA, the creation of NOAA, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, the National Environmental Policy Act. These are the fundamental baseline laws of our land that anybody who cares about the environment work from, and they were all created under a Republican administration, all of them. And so this issue of climate, the issue, broader issue of the environment being partisan, 
is horrific, and it should have never gotten here, but it's where we are. So I have no idea what my next slide is. Oh, so increased in this, uh, some of you have seen this picture before. That is actually the Washington State Senate budget as it passed off the floor last year. And this is when I was trying to get the money for the Ocean Acidification Center and some other things that I'll talk about later. And literally, the Republicans everywhere that I had ocean acidification in the entire budget, it's a 3,000 some page document, everywhere it said ocean acidification, it was lined out and it said ocean pH balanced. My, my aide in my office said, isn't that my deodorant? Um, so I'm glad a couple people laughed because my jokes have been bombing today. So uh, that's even better. I'll just bag on myself. So um, anyway, the paranoia around this, it's not just that it's partisan, it's freaky. We had a guy testify in the Environment Energy Committee this morning at 8 a.m. in Olympia, Washington, a state with some really bright people who basically, and I am summarizing here to be fair, but basically he told us that if you believe in climate change, you are certifiably insane. You are crazy. And this guy was there from the, uh, what's the, Harland Institute. Yeah, flew out from the East Coast to tell us this. Um, last year we had a, a gentleman. Uh, testify uh, and was brought in by, by the chair of the committee to speak. Uh, and at the end of his testimony, I said um, to him, I said, okay, and I apologize, I don't remember the number, but I'll make it up because I'm Irish. Uh, so um, because I'm Irish, I get to make jokes like that. It's the Irish family, you know. So anyway, I won't go there. So um, I, I said to him, and I, again, number may not be correct, I said something like, okay, so. I have 217, it was like I have like 111 peer-reviewed papers in front of me representing 217 scientists. They're all directly contrary to everything you've said in your testimony. How do you explain that? And this guy said, well, all of those studies are based on data from NOAA, NASA, and the National Science Foundation, it is commonly known that all of those organizations manipulate their data. To which I replied, so it's some grand conspiracy. And he said, well, you said it, Senator, not me. So that is uh, what we're up against now because we're in this situation. And so we got this changed in the end, uh, but it was a fight. And so at first I was furious. And I had this floor speech written where I was going to rip them apart. I was just going to make them look as dumb as they were making themselves look. And then I realized that's not the goal either. If I got to get something done, I still got to work with these guys. So you can't beat them up. So it was about, okay, I, don't, I won't even do a floor speech on this. I'm going to pull them aside and say, do you really want this to go public? And explain to them how stupid that would look. Um, and we got it changed. Uh, and in the end, we got it funded. Um, but this brings me to my biggest point. Who remembers Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Who took like, you know, your Psych 101 course, right? So just to be quick here, you can't reach one step until you've, reached, until you've satisfied the step below it. Uh, you first have to do, you know, what is it, food and water, and then shelter, and then companionship, and then uh, eventually you reach self-actualization, which I envision as like Yoda floating on a cloud. So um, uh, this is uh, a really important because um, we all want people to care about oceans and environment and climate. And who I'm hearing from? I'm hearing from people down. See, I knew I can. Something wasn't going to work. There you go. I've got a little pointer. <laughs> uh, I hear from people down here. I hear from people that are worried if they're going to be able to feed their kids. They're worried if they're going to keep a roof over their head. And if they're not, they're worried about loved ones or family members or community members who might be in that place. Or because we're coming out of uh, this horrible economic time, people are still extremely paranoid, back to that other slide as well, that um, even thinking about the environment is not where we can go. Where we need to go is only um, talking about how do we protect people from losing their home, how do we protect issues. Uh, that really matter and the environment, you know, I, I remember um, years ago, and Terry, I think you were there, I gave a lecture on Orcas Island at the Northwest Straits Commission Conference and it was titled, uh, you don't give a crap about salmon if you can't feed your kids. Uh, and that's that's just the reality, right? And and so Maslow's hierarchy of needs is very real when we think about not the individual, uh, well, it may be, 
true with the individual as well, but when you think about community and community needs, and I have to, I represent, I, I can't remember, 150, 160,000 people or something. I can't remember that number. I really should know that. Um, uh, I represent a lot of people, and so I need to listen to all of them, and a majority of them are not coming in to me saying, uh, you know, what about this key environmental issue? They're coming in to me, and they're talking about jobs. And so when we think about issues like climate, notion of acidification, and you could put in any other issue you want to uh, from the environment and science and so on, uh, uh, there's a way to articulate it where you start talking about jobs. And, and, and that resonates with me, that resonates with my peers, and it resonates in a way that purely talking about uh, you know, ocean acidification or pH balance or something doesn't. Um, the incredible opportunity we have with ocean acidification it is one of the first times that we've been able to draw an exact, very clear linkage between climate and jobs. So I am able to say that I have lost shellfish jobs in Washington State directly because of ocean acidification. They moved to Hawaii. Um, and, uh, and we could lose more. And so we start looking at the numbers and we say, okay, what does it mean for our economy? Well, there's 3,200 jobs and $270 million annually associated with Washington shellfish fisheries. That's a lot of jobs and that's a lot of money. And that starts to be real numbers. Um, what's difficult in the past when we talk about ecosystem services and the different uh, uh, economic drivers associated with the natural environment is sometimes it's smaller numbers. Um, but one of the things I, I actually don't have in here is uh, just outdoor recreation in Washington alone is $6.1 billion in annual spending and directly supporting almost 70,000 jobs. That right, that's Boeing right there. You know, We just gave Boeing a $9.2, $9.8 billion tax break over 16 years. If outdoor recreation were an individual company, we'd be bending over backwards to do something for them, but it's fractured into a whole bunch of different companies. So, but it, that entire industry is based on a healthy environment. So those sorts of arguments are the arguments we need to start making when we're talking about this stuff. So um, if uh, the food web connections, which some of you are studying with regard to ocean acidification, the University of Anchorage, Alaska is doing some incredible stuff. Um, so ocean acidification we know, and nobody can argue, unless you're going to tell me I'm crazy for believing in climate change too, um, nobody can argue that ocean acidification is seriously harming our shellfish industry or shellfish in general. Um, there's data out of Anchorage talking about the relations to uh, crab. Uh, there's data here coming from here at the UW and from NOAA and some others looking at the food web connections. You start to hit those food web connections, you start to hit some much bigger fisheries, and you start to talk about 42,000 jobs, or this is my number, a whole bunch more jobs. Um, the other thing, though, and I'm sorry that slide's blurry. I actually put this slideshow together on the plane ride up here, so I was a little bouncy, and I was trying to do it seriously. So sorry that's blurry. That's actually a uh, forest in uh, north central uh, Washington state, and the brown area is a bug infestation uh, attributed to the changes in climate and the changes in weather. We are losing the health of our forests. Um, on the left, uh, that is a very clear example of a decreased snow cap, that, uh, snowpack. That area there, uh, sorry, I really like snowcap ale, and I was thinking that's so a snowpack there um, has been decreasing readily. And so you want to start talking about some other impacts. The state's uh, forest industry, 118,000 jobs in forestry in Washington State. That's a real number, and that's a lot of people. Um, we have not been successful, however, in being able to articulate that direct linkage between the climate and the beetle infestations, bug infestations, and so on, uh, even though uh, the scientists in the room would say, actually, yeah, I can make that linkage for you very clearly. There's been a breakdown. Some of us who have been looking at that and answering those questions scientifically uh, have tried to communicate it to policymakers such as myself, and there's some sort of breakdown there because this message isn't holding true in Olympia, it's not holding true in Washington, D.C. For the most part, the folks involved in forestry uh, uh, are, are, are not getting caught up in the climate discussions, except for in one very, um, uh, four years ago, I believe it was, uh, Governor Gregoire put forward a proposal to do a cap-and-trade program, 
And what was very interesting is a lot of the forestry folks came on board because of carbon sequestration in timber. Uh, and so again, it goes back to jobs and IE, their bottom line. And so all of a sudden, if there's going to be a carbon um, uh, market program in Washington State, uh, and you feel like that's actually starting to get some traction, you want to be in front of it. So if you're a warehouser in Simpson and you believe that you could get in front of it by arguing the carbon sequestration piece, uh, then all of a sudden that becomes an economic driver for warehouser Simpson or the private forest folks who occupy a ton of forestry in the Washington uh, pro Forest Protection, blah, I'm really butchering this, I wish that wasn't on camera because I like those guys. Um, so anyway, private foresters. Um, but we're still not making this connection. The carbon sequestration piece comes back whenever we get more involved in the climate discussions, but only at that point. Um, the other one is in agriculture. So 160,000 jobs. This directly links to our snowpack. If, if, if our snowpack can, can, continues to be depleted, we continue to have earlier spring runoffs and so on, um, that really messes up agriculture, particularly in eastern Washington. Um, this connection, however, is a little more faded than the forestry connection. We're not doing a good job of making this connection, but there's far more jobs in agriculture than in uh, aquaculture. So we need to make this connection, and we need to think about it when we're working here. Um, so I want to go into a little bit of what we've done here in Washington State, and, uh, and then I will leave time. I'm going to do some Q&A. Is that all right? Good. So um, as most of you are probably aware, uh, Governor Gregoire launched the Washington State Shellfish Initiative uh, a few years back. I served on the Blue Ribbon Panel. Uh, last fall, we, that, that initiative launched this Blue Ribbon Panel. We spent a year researching ocean acidification. I, I say that very loosely because people like Terry and Jan actually researched it. And I sat there and said, OK, tell me what you know. Um, but at the end, we came up with a final report and recommendations to the legislature and the governor, uh, which was, I believe, uh, an excellent document. And, and, uh, and I'll tell you, the, the process was fascinating. Normally, when we set up these blue ribbon panels politically, we are in a situation where the scientists kind of you know, come in and speak to us and then walk away, and then we have these more political discussions. One of the most interesting pieces of this was that we had the scientists on the panel at the table with us, and we were real time kind of talking about different issues. I remember when Jan and Dick Feely came in with some new data that was literally days old, and it really was a course correction for our discussion at that point in time. Um, I think it's a model for how to be successful in some of these discussions. Um, but in the end, we produced this incredible report, um, and uh, I was very worried that it was just going to sit on the shelf. Um, and let me give you a quick story. I Years ago, so in November of, I think it was November 99, uh, several foundations, private philanthropy, like, you know, Packard, Pew, and some others, brought 30 of us together from around the country. And they said, um, uh, you know, Clinton's just done the Oceans Act. We're going to set up a, uh, uh, the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy. And we want you guys to help them uh, make sure that they do this incredible report and it's sound science and it comes out strong and powerful and so on. And so we spent a couple few years and a lot of money making sure that the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy and the Pew Oceans Commission as, uh, came out with big, bold recommendations. And they really were thoughtful in those recommendations. And so we spent a lot of time doing this. And then they did. And then the first thing was, you know, Pew released their report. And it was fairly progressive, and everybody said, well, that's the Pew Commission. Wait till the U.S. Commission comes out. What was fascinating is the U.S. Commission on Ocean Policy came out uh, several months later with their final report and recommendations, and they were nearly identical. In the areas where they actually overlapped in their mission, the governmental body appointed by President Bush had very similar, if not identical, recommendations to the Pew Commission uh, uh, body. Um, and we were overjoyed, and we celebrated, and we jumped up and down, and went, "Woo! This is amazing!" We got these big, bold reports, and then it was literally about a year later when we all realized, "Oh, wait, that wasn't the goal. The goal is implementing those recommendations. Getting them on paper doesn't mean a damn thing. You've got to implement them." So then, in that scenario, we formed the Joint Oceans Commission initiative, which was the commissioners from the U.S. Commission and the Pew Commission, which still exists, and you guys should check them out. Because uh, they're amazing. 
Uh, it's now chaired by uh, Bill Ruckel's house and Norm Mineta. Norm Mineta was not one of the commissioners, but came on board because he cares about oceans, and he's just an incredible person. Um, I, if you don't know Norm Mineta, you should just look up his story alone. He's really just amazing. Um, so um, where was I? Oh, this report. So we came out with this report, and several of us were very worried that it was just going to be a report, and it was going to sit on a shelf. And so we went to work trying to figure out, okay, how are we going to implement these recommendations? And some of them are very politically difficult because the report is bold enough. We were thoughtful and bold at the same time, which is always difficult. Um, and we actually get into dealing with the climate issues. We also, in the recommendations, we also take a look at the watershed issues and say, you know, nutrient loading from certain watersheds may be an impact here. We better take a look at that. You immediately start making some folks in the agricultural industry very angry. We put all that in writing. We released this, so now we want to do something with it. That's a huge political hurdle. Um, so we were successful uh, so far in, in doing some things. And so here in Washington State, uh, we um, did a few things just on OA, and I'll circle back to climate here as well. Um, we created a body to, uh, that is tasked with implementing the recommendations of the Ocean Acidification Blue Ribbon Panel, uh, and we were able to fund that body. Uh, and we've had our first meeting, and it's starting to move forward. And Martha Kungsgaard, who is also the chair of the Puget Sound Partnership Leadership Council, is now the chair of this body. So there's some great overlap there, too. And I'm, I'm excited. I'm proud that that's moving forward. Uh, I also am nervous because of the tasks ahead of us, and, and it's going to take a lot of political will to do this. Um, we, uh, on the funding, we got $1.8 million for the University of Washington to create the Ocean Certification Center, which we have some wonderful leaders of that sitting here today, and thank you both for stepping up. You're crazy. Uh, um, uh, two years ago, I uh, stole an idea from Senator Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island, U.S. Senator. He uh, had this great idea to create NEO, the National Endowment for the Oceans. And basically what it says is we get a whole bunch of money from bottom lands leasing in federal waters. A portion of that should be permanently dedicated to ocean conservation, science, and management. So this is, you know, guys laying a cable or guys putting an offshore rig. They are leasing federal public lands on the ocean floor, and they're paying a lot of money for it. Some of that money should go back into the resources that we're trying to protect and manage. So the National Endowment for the Oceans um, has actually passed the Senate and the House. Unfortunately, it was in different years. Um, and so we got it through the House with Norm Dix being an absolute champion. Uh, and then uh, we got it through the Senate the next year, but we had already lost the House, so they just laughed at it, said it wasn't going to go anywhere. That's not fair. They didn't laugh at it. They, they, there was some serious discussion. But as of today, it still has not passed. That idea, however, can be done at the state level. And so what I did is I, I got with, together with some of my budget writers, and I said, you know, how do we do this? Um, at the same time, gooey duck harvests in Washington State have increased our bottom lands leasing revenue by about $20 million. Uh, and so um, uh, there was some new money coming in from this, this source. And so we set up an account, and we said, okay, let's, let's create a fund. And uh, I just call it the Ocean Trust Fund. It's got some other stupid bureaucratic name. But what it does is it takes a portion of the bottom lands leasing revenue from Washington State and it puts it back into ocean conservation, science, and management. And so we got $4.2 million in that in the last budget cycle. This budget cycle, I was able to get $3.7 million. Um, and I hope it's going to just continue um, as we go forward. A good portion of that money, almost a million dollars now, I need to tell you guys what I agreed to yesterday. Another hundred and fifty k just kind of. I shouldn't have said that on camera. Uh, uh, anyway, about a million dollars now uh, has gone to ocean acidification work. On the climate side in Washington State, as many of you or all of you may be aware, um, the governor uh, introduced uh, some request legislation, which I prime sponsor, which created the Climate Legislative Executive Work Group. That body has had a number of public meetings over the last year, and we were tasked very simply with coming up with what Washington State was going to do to address climate. Not have an argument or a debate on whether or not climate change is real. Not have a debate on if we're going to act, but have a debate on what we're going to do about climate change in Washington State, and particularly how we're going to meet, specifically how we're going to meet our already in statute greenhouse gas emissions targets. So 
Um, we spent the last year looking at a number of things. We had some consultants do research all over the world on every different program in different jurisdictions, what was working, what didn't, and what we've come up with in Washington State. And just last week, we were released our final report and recommendations, um, and now we need to act upon them. Uh, but unfortunately, there were two Republicans, two Democrats, with the governor as a chair. So I was uh, the Senate lead on this, and then Representative Fitzgibbon uh, was the Democrat from the House, Representative Short was a Republican, and then Senator Erickson uh, was the, a Republican senator, and then the governor was a non-voting chair. So three of the four legislators had to vote to do a final report that was a full clue report. Um, unfortunately, uh, the Republicans and the Democrats couldn't agree. Uh, so we released two reports. Uh, and so the Democratic report from the Climate Legislative Executive Work Group uh, puts out a uh, bold and I believe thoughtful uh, vision for what we need to do. And that is simply that we have to have a cap and market program here in Washington State. We have to. We have to. There's no way we are going to meet our greenhouse gas targets if we do not do a large program. And so that could be a cap of trade, that could be a carbon tax, but there's got to be some sort of cap, there's got to be some sort of market on carbon in Washington State. And this is not just an environmental issue, this is an economic issue. If you, I, I don't have the numbers here today, but it is millions and millions of dollars uh, going up exponentially as we move forward if we do not act upon climate in Washington State. The second thing we need to look at is, and this is in our recommendations, is coal by wire. So it was, a, it was decided a long time ago that you calculate carbon uh, where it is used, not where it's uh, created, right? So um, while we only have one coal-fired uh, power plant in Washington State, um, uh, and it's uh, coming offline soon and hopefully switching over to natural gas, uh, uh, so we don't have big carbon uh, coal emitters in Washington State, a significant portion of the portfolio of Avista, Puget Sound Energy, and uh, Pacific Core, which are major power providers right here in this area and other places around the state, uh, receive a, a lot of their portfolio comes from Coal Strip, Montana. And so the term coal by wire means that we are receiving a carbon footprint because we're getting coal-fired energy, electricity from Montana that we're using here in Seattle and throughout Washington State, which uh, is, is devastating. And it's, it, it can be as high, depending on where hydro and water levels are, it can be as high as 40 percent in some of these portfolios on any given day. Most of the time, I believe it hovers around 25 to 30. Um, so coal by wire. The second thing we need to take a look at, a third thing we need to take a look at is low carbon fuels. Uh, so unlike most states who don't have as much hydro on online as us, um, uh, our transportation uh, impact on carbon output and greenhouse gas emissions in Washington State is significant. And so we need to take a serious look at that. And uh, Representative Fitzgibbon and the, and the governor and I believe that looking at low carbon fuels is a great way to get at that. Um, so those recommendations came out. The Republicans uh, put forward some other things, uh, uh, one of which I, I absolutely agree with, actually, which is I, I believe we should also take another look at uh, nuclear. And some of you may not agree with me on that, but uh, nuclear is actually clean in, in, until you have a problem. <laughs> uh, but uh, there's, there's some opportunities there, and I don't think because just because of Fukushima where um, there was a management problem that really caused that, should we all just turn our back on that discussion. I'm not saying we should cite new nuclear facilities tomorrow in Washington State. I'm saying that we should be open to having the dialogue. Uh, the other thing that both sides did agree on is we need to do an economic analysis of any programs that we're, we're putting forward, which obviously you would do. One of the differences between the Republicans and the Democrats, the Republicans were saying that we've got to do that economic analysis first. I had to point out that you can't do an economic analysis and tell you what you know what you're doing the analysis of. So you can't say, I want to do an economic analysis of a cap-and-trade program in Washington State until you know what that cap-and-trade program is, where the cap is, and everything else. So they can be just done simultaneously, but they can't, you couldn't do the economic analysis when you don't have the program. Um, so there's some great stuff moving forward. I have, yeah. Regionally, oh, i got to point something out here. You know, our logo, you see this? So there's Washington State's logo. Look at these guys. These guys have some cool logos. Look at British Columbia. British Columbia's got the coolest logo ever. So um, anyway, and I guess not logo, sorry, it's state seal. I am, I am not at all senatorial. Uh, so anyway, uh, regionally there's some incredible work going on, uh, both on climate and on ocean acidification. And it's primarily on both these issues, the West Coast is really leading the way. Um, but 
Maine, uh, Massachusetts, uh, some other places around the country are very interested in ocean, ocean acidification particularly because they have a very similar, uh, some similar economic drivers to us. So the same job arguments make sense. But um, uh, we just recently, uh, in October of last year, uh, uh, Premier Clark, Governor Brown, Governor Inslee, Governor Kitzhaber came together to sign this climate agreement, really looking at how we can work together on greenhouse gas emissions on the West Coast. And that is actually turning into action. That is not just words on paper. Um, there's some very serious discussions going on about how we can collaborate regionally on the West Coast with climate and what that means. And now each state will do, and province will do things differently. but. Yeah, um, uh, I believe in the very near term you're going to see actions on the regional level that will make significant differences. I should also point out on the ocean acidification side, Alaska is really at the table. Um, I've met personally with Governor Parnell a couple times on this. I've met with his staff several times. The guy gets it um, and, uh, and, and, and is willing to step up. He actually just put into the University of Anchorage, Alaska, I can't remember it, just over a million dollars I believe on some of their research and so on. Um, and so it doesn't have to be a partisan issue, particularly when we're both hearing from the same sorts of constituents telling us it matters. Um, so um, the other thing is there was a, a memorandum of understanding signed uh, between um, uh, California and Oregon with Washington participating so that they can start ramping up and they've created this ocean acidification hypoxia blue ribbon panel um, because they got jealous because our blue ribbon panel was so cool and they didn't have one. Um, and so they're going through a similar process so that they can get up to speed on those things. Um, and my last point here is I, I am very hopeful that things are going to continue to move forward, but it's only if we're strategic. And, um, and sometimes being strategic doesn't mean you're being nice. Um, and let me explain that a little bit. So I believe that any politician anywhere in the world needs two things to do the right thing. We need political cover and we need political pressure and we can't have one without the other. So I need all of you and a hundred more people to come into my office and say, right on, I'm so glad you care about ocean acidification, keep doing it, here's what we need. That's my political cover. You come in, you, you, you tell me that you're supporting my actions and that I'm moving in the right direction. But I need all of you and 200 more people to come in and yell at me and scream at me and ruin my day if I don't. And that's the political pressure. And that's where we're not always uh, strategic enough because sometimes we don't want to single somebody out because oh well you know I'm a Democrat and they're a Democrat and I don't want to bash them uh, or I'm a Republican they're a Republican or maybe it's the opposite like he's the only Republican that I think is voting on my issues so I don't want to slam him whatever forget all that if we're gonna move on these actions you guys and many more like you have got to be willing to react and be strategic it doesn't just mean you come in and scream or make threats or whatever, uh, but make sure that I know that I'm not going the right, that I know that you believe I'm not going the right way. Hold my feet to the fire. So I've got to have that political cover, but I've got to have that political action. It's abs or, or, or political pressure. It's absolutely critical. Uh, and again, you can't have one without the other. Um, so this is the bill signing. I look really funny there. I don't know why, but uh, for the governor's climate bill, um, and so my point here, I guess, is that, you know, we could all be happy and, and do some pretty cool stuff when we're strategic and when we're thoughtful about it and when we're willing to push the limits. The governor coming out on climate as, strong, as strongly as he has in his first term, frankly, his first days, um, uh, is very bold. Um, it will be very telling to see how that comes up in the next election. Uh, I am extremely proud of my governor because he doesn't care. He's kind of like, this is the right thing to do, so let's move in that direction. And he's being thoughtful about it. He's looking at the economics of it. Uh, we all are. Um, but sometimes you've just got to make the decision to take the action. Um, but a majority of my colleagues are not going to take action on climate, ocean acidification, and these issues unless they are educated, unless they understand the connections to jobs, and unless they know that there's going to be the pressure and it could threaten them in their next election. Um, so I, I I love this, like, except for this girl over here, she's just, she's getting ready to steal all the pens, I think. I don't know, she's got no smile, no nothing. I don't even know if I have another slide. No, that's it. So, um, I guess, well, I've made my point. Why don't we just open up to questions, and if I didn't make my point, you can yell at me now.
Questions or comments? No, you don't get to talk first. I, I'm teasing Fred, please. Fred, please. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, it's not just chairing, it's forage fish, and I'm familiar with I better be. I'm number two on it. Good. So can you share with us one more thing? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's looking at a number of issues with regard to forage fish and really trying to ramp up some of the issues. Uh, Senator Christine Rolfus, who when I mentioned there's only two or three of us that really understand and grab, uh, grab onto these issues. She's definitely right there with me. She's uh, just fantastic. Uh, and she's the prime sponsor on it. And we just introduced it a couple days ago. Um, so it's going gonna, it's gonna to be looking at ramping up our programs and, and also looking at the forage fish protections associated with habitat and so on. So. No. Sorry. Yeah, well, it's Christine. She came to me. I just signed number two. Yeah. So you suggest we need to get 200 people just like ourselves to come in and bother you and, and your equipment. So the 200 people like me are in this room. So how, how do we collectively all go find 200 people or, or spread that message to enough people to do it? You know, um, what, what can we do? Yeah, yeah. So. I think it's it's the it's the beginning piece. You know, I, I think a lot of the people that you probably talk to are already there. So, what we need to do is talk to different people, and that and the way we do that is make, we make different arguments. Um, Bill Dewey and Bill Taylor at Taylor Shellfish are have always been wonderful folks on water quality issues because it there's directly relates to their bottom line. They. We're not the extreme advocates they are on something like ocean acidification until that hit their bottom line. And what they've been able to do uh, is reach out to their colleagues um, in the shellfish industry, and now more broadly, uh, you know, Bill Dewey representing Taylor Shellfish. Uh, Taylor Shellfish is a large member of AWB, the Association of Washington Business, who historically has been absolutely opposed to. Uh, I don't think I'm out of line in saying I can't remember a, a climate issue they've ever supported. Um, and so this is the association of every, of every large Washington business in the state. Well, Taylor Shellfish is a member. So when they started to come out against the CLU legislation, it was Bill Dewey who went to them and Bill Taylor and said, hey, we are big members of your organization and back up and explained why. And so AWB still was difficult during that process, but not like they would have been. And so my point is, um, I think we need to think outside the box in, in how we are talking about climate and ocean acidification and who we are talking to. And so I often say to people that, you know, um, there, was a, there was a presentation recently uh, that I was at and they were talking about all this incredible work they were doing to restore these sections of coastline. And they talked about the habitat that was protected and they talked about the removal of bulkheads and all this stuff and nowhere in the entire lecture did they talk about the jobs associated with that? And so I asked the first question, and I said, "Well, how many people did you hire to do this?" And they said, "Oh, it was you know we hired we 27 people in this little town on the South Pacific coast of Washington State." And I said, "Well, that should be your first point. Your first point is we created 27 jobs in like Poquium, you know, a town of like 900 or something, right?" So uh, those sorts of points. So it's, it's flipping that argument. It's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know? Okay, so I need to talk to people so they're listening to me, not so I'm listening to myself. Um, and so part of it is changing the message. Part of it is, um, you know, uh, uh, it, it's been said twice. Uh, Governor Inslee got a uh, huge 
press piece over this, um, and he's going to hate me for it, but he stole it from past Mayor Mike McGinn uh, because I was there when the governor heard it too, and the governor said, wow, that's a really good point. And then three, day, three weeks later at the big climate unveiling in San Francisco when they signed the regional agreement, Governor Inslee said, we are the first generation to experience the impacts of climate change. Unfortunately, we are also the last generation who will be able to do anything about it. And that's a really heavy statement. And so that sort of thing, too, uh, gets into another point. You know, I don't know if anybody's ever read Paulo Freire and Pedagogy of the Oppressed and some of his work. Um, I, I have no idea if Paulo Freire actually said this or it was just something I gleaned from reading his, his work. But this mentality of crisis creates community. If you can identify a crisis that people care about, be it jobs or another sort of crisis that people care about, it's a health issue, it's going to impact my kids, that will also grab people. Um, so now I'm just on a bit of a tangent, sorry, but I hope I answered your question. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, p the Grace Harbor and Willapa uh, 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 shellfish industry folks have been very active in this discussion. Um, the, the, it, it goes right back to the jobs. So Grace Harbor is experiencing still, I believe, double-digit unemployment. Um, this is a this is a county uh, and Pacific County where Willapa, same thing. These are counties that were you know super majority relying upon forestry timber. Uh, and then salmon, both of those went in the hole. Um, now they've got tourism and uh, some other economies driving upward, um, economic drivers coming up. But um, they are in desperate need for jobs. And so this is a situation where, and actually I believe that the, that one may be offline now as far as moving forward, the, the storage tank facility. Um, but it's it still could be on the books any day if it's not right now. Um, but so this is a case where somebody comes in and they say, I'm going to give you 500 jobs and you've got 4,000 of your buddies out of work. That sounds pretty good. And so it's really difficult to have a discussion about environmental protection when somebody's offering you jobs. Um, years ago, I, I, I was fortunate enough to work um, with Surfrider Foundation on an initiative down in Baja where um, at Laguna de San Ignacio, one of the areas where the gray whales come, uh, have their calves. Uh, Mitsubishi was proposing a huge salt works, um, and uh, it was an incredible experience because we learned that uh, you can actually make this argument. But what happened is it was it was it was easy for us to demonstrate that the Mitsubishi salt works was going to wipe out their fisheries, wipe out uh, any bit of tourism they had, uh, and their entire lifestyle. But Mitsubishi was saying, "Hey, yeah, but we're going to give you a bunch of jobs," and we were able to make an argument with the locals that the sort of jobs they were offering may not be the jobs that you want. Um, but that sort of argument's difficult to make. So the issue with exports, and frankly, uh, I was asked recently, what's the number one issue that anybody thinking about the environment, I don't care if you're terrestrial or water, or whatever, the number one issue coming down the line that we all need to pay attention to is energy transportation, energy transmission transportation. Um, we uh, uh, have extreme difficulty citing pipelines. Uh, there is now 110% capacity for 100 years. Natural gas has been identified through fracking. Um, we have the Vulcan and the um, uh, oil sands oil a bit has been developed. Um, it would be, uh, th there's a lot of questions with that stuff, but guess what? It's going to be used. So the reality is you don't discover that much of an energy resource and that much of a dollar value and not use it. So I met with, um, and Ken Hughes, the Energy and Environment Minister uh, for Alberta, uh, he and I actually have a, a really good relationship now. And actually, he's not the minister anymore. He just changed his position there. But um, he was very clear with me in saying, you know, this oil is going to be used, it's going to be exported, and we can either go north, south, east, or west, but we're going to export our product. Um, the reason I bring all that up is we are going to see a significant increase of oil trains in Washington State. All four of the major refineries in Washington State have sought and been granted permits for one train a day. They're already starting to talk about two trains a day. Um, you have the tank facility proposed out in Grace Harbor. 
uh, where you could have trains going out there exporting oil. You also have barge traffic. So I'm very proud that in Washington State we had the strongest oil spills protection, protection and response program in the, in the country right here in Washington State. But that entire program is based on oil tankers. So as that program has ramped up, so has the size and frequency of oil barges, which do not qualify under those protections. So the barges used to come from Anacortes Refinery down to Seattle, and now, uh, and, and carry like, you know, 30,000 gallons of crude. Now they're carrying 3 million gallons of crude, and they're going out the Straits of Juan de Fuca and all the way down to Long Beach. Um, so there's all this transportation issue going on with energy, and none of us are paying, paying enough attention. We all get, when there's a crisis, we hear, we hear about a train blowing up and we freak out. Um, and now there's been three or four trains, so we're starting to pay a little bit more attention. Uh, I think the goal is to maintain that community after the crisis has passed. So after that train's blown up and five days has passed, how do you keep people caring about the train? Um, and some of that goes back to the economics. You know, if if there's a train coming by your uh, the Skagit River Brewery right on the tracks in Mount Vernon, if you're at the Skagit River Brewery having a burger and a train comes by, that whole building shakes. But it's kind of a novelty because it only happens, you know, every four or five hours. If it happens every 40 minutes, that's not a novelty, that's a migraine, and I don't want to eat there anymore. So now it hit my bottom book, right? So, yeah. What time is it? Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. Any more? Yeah, please. Is this live streaming right now? Um, I believe we are going to see some actions. <laughs> so I, uh, you have a, uh, a very motivated uh, group of legislators and a governor who really gets it. Uh, it's fascinating talking to Governor Inslee about these issues because he's really knowledgeable. Um, we had a meeting recently with Jane Lubchenco, who's the past uh, administrator for NOAA, uh, undersecretary for Commerce, uh, appointed by Obama in his first term. And uh, it was Bill Ruckel's house, uh, Jane Lubchenco, as two members of the Joint Oceans Commission, and Governor Inslee and myself, a couple others. And, and Governor Inslee said, uh, he said, so I just want to make sure I've got my science right on ocean acidification. And, and so he looked at Jane and he said, he said, so can I just kind of say what I think is going on? He went through this extremely articulate from the bottom up, this is what's happening. I was sitting there going, God, I'm reading books on the side. I'm not keeping up. Um, so my point is we have some people in power. Uh, who are motivated to do something, and, and I think that we'll, we'll see some actions coming out of that. Um, all of us are committed to not allowing that report, our final report and recommendations that we released. Uh, we're, we are all committed to not allowing that to just sit on the shelf. Um, and, and so um, uh, we'll see what comes of that. Yeah. So two points. Um, 
first of all, and I, I said this earlier, but let me try and underscore it. Um, if you have an incredible expertise in, in science and research uh, and you're doing that incredible work, um, uh, well, let me back up. I can name five scientists, two of them are in the room, that I've worked with worldwide who have the ability to do the incredible research and articulate that in a way that, that my peers and others at different levels can understand. That's a skill set, and it's very rare that people possess both of those. And, and, and you shouldn't have to. If you're an incredible scientist, be an incredible scientist. But know that you can't stay in the lab and just do your science. You've got to find somebody. So I believe the greatest skill anybody can have in the world is to know what you don't know. And then what you need to do is you surround yourself with people who complement your weaknesses, and then together you got a really cool team. So if you're an incredible scientist, you need to team up with people who can articulate your science to a policymaker. And and, and, and then if it's something else, you, you team up with the right communications people. But you can't do it alone. None of us can. But you have got to make sure that you recognize what you're not able to do, and you surround yourself with people who can. My second point and this is where Terry and Jan and Doe Gatos and Dick, Dick Feely probably, he really, wow, uh, really get frustrated with me. My job is to push scientists, okay? And I am sick and tired of people telling me i got to study it more. At some point, at some point, doesn't the precautionary principle come into play? At some point, you know, there's a great quote. If you look, uh, there's a Showtime special coming out on climate change, and the trailer's up now. It's called The Years of Living Dangerously. Um, and there's a great quote on the trailer, and I can't remember who says it. And he goes, there's somebody who says, you know, if 99 out of 100 doctors told you you needed a surgery tomorrow or you were going to die, would you really go and find the 100th doctor? I mean, at some point, at some point, we've got to have enough data to act. Um, and so uh, for all of you who are scientists, I applaud you, and I love that you're doing what you're doing because I couldn't do that. I know that I don't know that. Um, but what I do know is at some point you guys got to give me enough um, to, to show me that I can act. Because what's, what's really difficult for me is when somebody comes in and says, you know, I am really, really almost sure that, uh, you know, that ocean acidification is, in, is impacting the Alaska crab fishery. And then I go, okay, well, let's go to Parnell and have this conversation. Whoa, well, well, we're not 100% sure. Well, when are we going to be 100% sure, damn it? Because I need, I need, if I, if I go in to a governor and I say we got to act because all this data says we got to act, and then he calls the same scientists I'm basing my conversation on, and they go, well, we're not 100% sure, bam, your conversation's over. So it's two things. First of all, surround yourself with people who complement your weaknesses. But secondly, at some point, even though all of your training here at the University of Washington and elsewhere is telling you, that you've got very strict parameters on how you become the scientist that you are, you've also got to not be afraid to act. So. Thank you.